have something else that I want to celebrate with you this morning, and for those that have been around for a while, you will probably recognize the, the significance of this because it's going to save us both some heartache. My wife has gifted me with my first old man Bible. It is large print. I can see it with or without my glasses. I can see it from a normal angle. It's awesome. <laughs> I have been struggling with all kinds of body parts that have been falling off and breaking and not working right over the last little bit. And uh, I am losing the battle with my eyes. And uh, I, I told Chris, as I celebrated when I first came in this morning, I said, hey, Chris, I got, look what I got. And he said, you could just get new glasses. I said, or I could wear them. Like, either way, like, there's all kinds of options here. But the one we went with was a new Bible. And so I am thankful for that. Um, and you will be too. So now I will be, you know, saying the right things when I read it and not misquoting scripture and doing this and all that weirdness. So that's going to be awesome this morning. And, and I am excited with you. I am excited uh, just about this whole day. Um, if you didn't know this, Easter is scary for pastors for a lot of reasons. One is, is anybody going to even show up? Uh, the other is what's going to go wrong? Who's not going to show up to be a greeter or nursery? What machine back there is going to not work like it's supposed to? Just a whole lot of stuff that can go wrong. Um, and uh, I, uh, I, 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 when I, when I went and sat down, I circled around the back because I remembered that I didn't tell JJ, who's running sound today, um, that we had someone else doing the offering. So I wanted to make sure that that went well. Um, and it was cool just for a moment to just stop in the back and watch from a perspective I don't normally get to see. Um, usually, most of the service, I'm up here looking at your beautiful faces. Uh, but it was awesome just to be in the back and see uh, our students taking up the offering, seeing people do what they're supposed to do, um, and just working this morning as an act of worship so that we together can enjoy this celebration. Um, it's just awesome to see that. It's, it's also great... Uh, because Easter, a lot of times, is kind of like a family reunion. It's when people who have moved away come back and join us. It's, it's when we, we all kind of mark it on our calendar. I know it's impossible to do this every Sunday as much as every pastor would love for it to happen. But it's one of those days we all kind of mark on our calendar. Like we're going to show up on Easter no matter what else pretty much is going on in life. And so it's just great to be able to see so many of you today and to spend time with you. Uh, but the priority, of course, is that we celebrate our risen Savior and all that that means to us. And today we're talking about how, because of the resurrection, we have the opportunity to have a restart in our lives. I was thinking this week about my first real job. Now, my first boss might not appreciate me putting it that way, but while I was in high school, I worked at a, at a chicken restaurant. And so it was the usual fast food thing, right? And so then after that, I had my first real job, like in an office with all the stuff that comes along with that. And uh, this was in the mid-90s. And so in that job was the first time I ever worked with computers outside of like the dinosaurs that we used to have in our classrooms at school. Um, and so that was where I learned about restarting your computer, right? That's, that's what you're always told. It doesn't matter what goes on with your computer. Like it can freeze. Smoke can be coming out of it. The screen can be cracked. A uh, child can be sitting on it. Your husband can throw it out the window. And you call tech support. And what's the first thing they say? Did you restart it? it it's no longer in one piece. But did you restart it? Well, I did some research today or this week because I was curious to see, like, like is that just like the mythical, magical fix-all, uh, or does it actually do stuff? And, and according to some of the tech blogs that I read, and some of you that are like actual computer geeks knew this better, you know, um, but, but it actually does fix some things. It actually does clear out some stuff, and, and this is what I thought was interesting on multiple blogs that I read, was that it, it erases... I wish I had your mind for a second right now, Noah, honestly, so I could challenge you and get the right terminology, so forgive me, because this is like the best I can come up with. But like, it just kind of it, it kind of cleans out some of the bad data and some of the bad memory and then literally brings it up with a fresh start. In, in, in a sense, it, not that you lose stuff that's stored there permanently, but the stuff that's not supposed to be there just kind of gets wiped away and your computer literally gets a fresh start. It gets to start all over again as if none of that bad stuff had happened. 
And I thought, man, what an amazing picture of the gospel. Because when we confess our faith in Christ and acknowledge him as Lord, he allows us to restart. He literally wipes out all of the bad stuff. Like, I get this terminology because I studied it for like 150 years. So right, all, like, all that t- sin, all that baggage, all that depravity, all of that death, all of that worry, all of that guilt, all of, all of that stuff just gets wiped away. And we get to start off. This morning, we're, we're going to start with the resurrection story, but then I want us to zero in on Peter and and see how that changed him. How this amazing process that he walked through, not because of him, of course, because of what Jesus did, but literally just washed everything clean and all the bad stuff that he used to be, and it gave him a chance for a fresh start. And what I want you to walk away with this morning knowing is that wherever you come from, like today could be the day that you walk away with a fresh start. If you're one of the ones that, that, and this is okay, like I'm not judging, but but I know there's probably someone like this in this room. Like you just came here because your mom or your wife or your grandma told you you had to, you had to dress up, you had to have a picture taken, and you had to sit through church for a little bit. Like those were just the demands that were put on you today. And so you really don't want to be here, and it could be that you're kind of skeptical about all this stuff, and that's okay. On the other end of the spectrum, you might be the person that's been boohooing and crying all day long already because you are so thankful for what Jesus has done. You have no doubt. You believe he was born of a virgin. You believe he lived a perfect, sinless life. You believe he died not just because of the Pharisees, but because of God's plan and for your sin. And you believe he walked out of the grave. And even without a Polaroid picture of it, you know it happened. And so we've got both of those spectrums here. And my hope is to encourage both of them. And for the one over here that believes it all, I want you to leave celebrating and cheering, understanding what God has done in your life and what he has set you free from and to. And for the one that's skeptical, I I hope that maybe I can give you a little bit of something that, that, that will begin to build that faith in you. Maybe even today would be the day that you would believe. We're going to do that by walking through, in a sense, a, a long chaotic roller coaster of a week. It began on Sunday, what we call now Palm Sunday. This was the day that Jesus came into Jerusalem. He had been working his way there for some time. And he'd been telling his disciples specifically, and this is important, specifically, I am going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die at the hands of the Pharisees, and then I'm going to raise again. And the disciples didn't hear any of it. None of it. It's like that time that you planned a date with someone. And they said, I'm going to meet you at Starbucks on Thursday, and you showed up on Wednesday. Because no matter how many times they said, I'll meet you there at Thursday at 6 o'clock, you heard Wednesday at 6 o'clock because that's what you really wanted, right? That's the way it works. Like We hear what we want and what connects best with us, and that's what the disciples were doing. They wanted Jesus to go to Jerusalem to set up an earthly kingdom, so no matter what he said, that's what they heard. He said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die at the hands of the Pharisees. And I'm going to be raised again by my own power. They said, cool, high five. You're going to Jerusalem to set up your kingdom. That's awesome. I can't wait. And when they got there on Sunday, that's exactly what the disciples must have thought was going to happen. And then Jesus taught in the temple, and it was a busy, it was a crazy week. And then on Thursday, things began to change a little bit. Thursday evening, they gathered in this place, in this room, in this upper room. Jesus had told them to go get this stuff to prepare for the Passover, and the disciples had brought it all together, and they went up in that room expecting just the, I'm sure, the average celebration of the Passover. And the Passover was their celebration of God delivering his people from Egypt. And so they would have been excited about all of that. They would have been looking forward to it. They would have been walking through. It's a really neat meal. If you've never had it broken down for you, every element in that meal pictures something from how God delivered his people from Egypt. They went through all of that, and then Jesus changed things a little bit. He took the bread, he took the wine. He he began what we call the Lord's Supper. Now a picture not of physical deliverance from another nation, but spiritual deliverance from sin and the grave and all of those things. They still didn't get it. That came to a close. They, They began to walk the path that would have wound up to this place called the Mount of Olives. And at the Mount of Olives, Jesus pulled them together with with a time of prayer, getting them ready for everything that was about to take place. Now, Jesus prayed, but the disciples slept because they were like, oh, that's what we would have done. 
And you have a good meal, you have a good church service, you go home and take a nap. Like, that's what they wanted to do. Jesus was like, stay up and pray. Okay, we'll pray now. That whole thing was going on. And suddenly men with torches and with weapons show up, and the whole night just kind of disintegrates in front of them. And over the next several hours, their worst nightmare became a reality. Even though back over here, Jesus has said, I am going to Jerusalem, I am going to die, and I am going to rise again. As it all began to happen, they just didn't know what to do. And so the guards came, and Peter pulls out a sword, and he cuts off a guy's ear, and then Jesus heals it. Because that wasn't what was the plan. And the guys get afraid when Jesus gets arrested, and so they all run. Every one of them. Jesus said, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to die. But I'm going to rise again. It's going to be okay. They didn't hear it. And so when things went south, they, they all ran. And here for the skeptic, here's one of those spots. I'm going to try to point some out to you as we go through things this morning. Here's one of the spots where I feel like we see the reliability of Scripture in the details that it gives. If I were telling the story, there would have been a fight scene. I watched Avengers, uh, Infinity War, over the last couple of days. It would have been one of those like, like massive fight scenes, right? And the disciples would have pulled out their weapons, and they would have gone to it. But that's not what happened. You've got one guy swinging and missing and barely taking off the ear. But here's what I love. <coughs> one guy ran away naked. Because as the guard reached out and grabbed him, he left his clothes behind. Like, you don't just make those things up. Like, that's one of those details, I believe that we were given within that account that tells us that this is something that really happened. Because you know some of you had that happen in high school. Just going to say. And the night goes downhill from that. Those that were brave enough to come back, watch as Jesus is questioned and beaten and questioned and beaten. Those that are brave enough to stand in the crowd, watch him on trial. And then they watch him massively beaten again. And I'm not going to go into gory details. I, I just don't do that when it comes to the story. I feel like it's, it's powerful enough without it. But suffice it to say that the beating that Jesus suffered before his crucifixion usually killed people. And he stood up under that. And then he carried my cross and your cross. And then he was nailed to it. And then he died. And as, as Chip said before he sang, I, I want you to... I want you, for just a minute, to put yourself in the place of one of those disciples. Like all your hope, all your dreams are on this man. You've left everything behind. You've left your job behind. You have left your home behind. You have followed him. You have traveled with him. You've seen him heal. You have seen him feed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch. You've seen him walk on water. If you're Peter, you almost died in the process. Like You've seen all of this stuff take place. And now he's hanging on a cross. Struggling for breath. And in a moment of intense pain that you can see all over his face, he says it's finished. And he goes limp and he's gone. Can you imagine for a moment the crushing blow that that was? It's hard for us because for those of us who genuinely we believe that we take it all on faith. We, we, we can see it in our minds and we believe 100% that it happened. We view it through the empty tomb. Have you seen those pictures on Facebook all, 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 all weekend? I love that, right? It's like you're in the tomb, you're looking out through the door and you see the cross. Well, that is really a picture of how we as Christians see it today. We can't just view the cross in that moment that Jesus died because we're already on the other side of the empty tomb. But in that moment, Right then, right there, they had no idea. They've been told. They've been told several times, but they didn't get it. They thought it was really real. They watched as this man who had done so many amazing things, who had made so many significant promises, was lowered from the cross, was wrapped up really quick and stuffed into someone else's tomb. This one they asked if they could borrow last minute because they had to get him in before the Sabbath. That is the place where the disciples were when we pick up today. 
in John chapter 20. That's, that, that's all the stuff that they just went through. Friday night ends with putting Jesus' body in, in this grave really quick and, and closing it up because they, they held tight to the Sabbath. They had to be home. They had to be rested from Friday evening to Saturday evening. Nothing's going on but sitting and waiting and mourning and thinking, why? And, and what happened? How could God let this happen? And you've had some moments in your life like that, I would bet, where this world just knocks you down. You, you get blindsided. You didn't see it coming. And your health fades, or your spouse's health fades, or the relationship ends, or your kid goes a direction that you didn't anticipate. Your, your job comes to an end. And in those moments, that, that's something we can identify with, right? We've asked those questions, why? Why would this happen? Why would God allow this to happen? And if you love me, if you have the power you say you do, why am I here now experiencing this? And that's part of the point of today, is that when we come to that place every time, even though we may look up and not be able to see the end of the tunnel, one of the things that we can know, we can write it down, and we can count on, is that when he walked out of the grave, he made a way for us through whatever it is that we're going through. Early Sunday morning, they didn't know that yet. So John 20, verse 1, it says this, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been moved from the entrance. And so she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. And so if all of this stuff is kind of new to you, you might not recognize um, some of the people here. So Mary um, was someone that we're told in, in another gospel that Jesus cast a lot of demons out of. And he, he wonderfully rescued her. Uh, Peter, we're going to talk about more in a minute. Over in this passage, you're going to see several times the other disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. That's John. That's the way he referred to himself throughout his book. Uh, he was the, the other disciple, the disciple that Jesus loved. So in verse 2, she came running to Simon Peter after she went to the tomb and she saw that it was empty. She came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. And she says, they've taken our Lord from the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. And so she's still in that moment, in that place of confusion and frustration and hurt. And worst of all, now she's gone through all this stuff that we've talked about, and she gets to the tomb, to, to the moment that she thought would be her at last act of love to Jesus, to finish the burial process for him. And, and the body's not even there. What do I do now? I've already had the, knock, the breath knocked out of me. Now I've got my feet taken out from under me. How much worse can you... I, I, I don't even know what to do, Peter. So verse 3, Peter and the other disciple ran to the tomb. Both of them were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. That's another one of those things I love. Like, like on, on one hand, you see the humility of John. I'm the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. I'm not even going to say my name, but I, you, you bet I could outrun Peter. I just want you to know that. Like, I'm going to kind of be humble about who I am, but I want you to know I ran that old man. Both of them were running in verse four, but the other Peter, or the other, the other disciple, outrun Peter and got to the temple. Oh my goodness, the tomb first. He, meaning John, bent over and he looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came also. Uh, behind him, and he went straight into the tomb. There's that amazing personality of Peter, right? I can't get there first, but I'm going to charge right in. I don't care what's going on. The guards might be in there. Snakes, scorpions, who knows? But I'm just going to run right on into the tomb and see what's going on. Went straight into the tomb, and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, and he saw and believed. They didn't understand, though, from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead, and the disciples went back to where they were staying. So at this point, we have one who believes. Three that have seen the same thing. Mary and Peter and John have all been to the tomb. The other Gospels tell us a few others have been there uh, as well. Mary didn't go initially by herself. There were several of them in her group that went. But of the group that has seen so far, they've seen the empty tomb. They've seen the grave cloths lying there. By the way, is another significant 
detail because if you steal a body, you don't normally fold the clothes up and put them back where you got them. You either take the linens with you or they just fall on the ground or you don't care because you just want to steal the body. They were told the clothes were still there, that John saw it and he believed. He didn't understand it all. And I think that's another thing that we need to learn about, about our faith and about what it means to follow Christ. Like you can believe in him and you can begin to follow him without knowing all the details, without understanding it all. John still didn't understand that Jesus had to rise from the grave. John still didn't understand all the theology behind what Jesus did on the cross. John still didn't know what was going to happen next. But in that moment, he a lot of times that God calls us to moments like that where we don't have all the grave filled in and we don't know how things are going to turn out. And he doesn't, he doesn't call on us to know all of that or to grasp all of that, but he always calls on us to believe and follow. Eventually, Peter's going to be there. The very next chapter, we have this scene where the disciples have gone back to Galilee, and they're, they're waiting, actually, to meet Jesus. And discouraged still and confused about everything that's going on, a group of them go back to fishing. It's almost like they just gave up. Like, we're just going to go back to what we need to know. And so they go out, and, and they're fishing, and Jesus calls them back to the shore. And that's where he has that moment with Peter, right? We'll talk more detail about that in a moment. But, but, but it is there on that beach when Jesus has that conversation with Peter that Peter finally gets it. So over the next few minutes, I just want to talk about how that changed Peter, because when he finally understood the resurrection, that's when he got his restart. That's when we see clearly through Scripture that the old Peter is gone, and this new Peter comes. The first part of that that we see is that he moves from fear to faith. Think back over the last few hours, uh, uh, well, the last few days that, that we he has gone through. He, he saw Jesus die on the cross, and when he saw that, he was hiding. When, when they came to arrest Jesus, Peter ran. When someone spotted him and recognized him, Peter denied being a follower of Christ. Peter was afraid. And before we cast too much judgment on Peter for his fear, I think we need to own up to that, that one of our most significant, maybe not our greatest, but one of our most significant fears is the same one that Peter experienced. And, and that's being different because of our faith, being called out because we are Christ followers. And you go back a decade or a couple of decades ago, and there was a noticeable difference in, in, in our culture within this country where you could be pretty open about your faith and nobody thought uh, anything about it. But I know more people now who, who, who are even friends who openly attack my faith. Never experienced that before the last five years or so. It's getting harder and harder in this country because what we believe and what we hold to in this is so radically different from the lifestyle that we're being told to embrace. We're being told, go after money, get all of it you can because that's the most important thing that you can have. And if you don't have money, at least have a lot of sex. Because that makes everything better. Run after every relationship you can because it's going to feel that void in your heart. And if you can't have that, then just throw yourself into this or throw yourself into that. And don't worry about the consequences for when things don't go right because you can just avoid them. A life very much contrary to God's word. And when we try to faithfully live up to what God's word says, We know that fear that Peter felt. Unlike other places in the world, we may not have to worry about losing our lives over it, but, but you may very much have to worry about losing your livelihood. I can tell you that if you go into sales, if you go into the law practice, if you go into the business world, it's going to be very hard to hold on to your integrity. It's going to be very hard to stand for everything that the Bible says and still move ahead. Because it's going to make you different. Paul wrote a letter to a young man that he had mentored and that he loved, that he called as a son named Timothy. And 
Paul had called Timothy and he had trained him and he had mentored him and then he put him, we believe, as a pastor in the church in Ephesus. And, and Timothy had a hard time there. It, it was just difficult. There was a lot that was going on and there were people who were standing in direct opposition to what Timothy was trying to do. And so Paul wrote him to encourage him. He said, first, remember your calling. Remember when we laid hands on you. Remember the faith that's been passed to you from your mother to grand, or your grandmother to your mother and to you. Remember all that God has done in your heart. And then he says this. The Spirit of God did not give us a spirit that makes us timid, but that gives us power and love and self-discipline. That's from 2 Timothy 1.7. And so we all face that kind of fear that Peter did, but we don't have to let it run our lives. We can rely on God as he learned to do eventually so that we have power in our lives, so that we have love in our lives that comes from self-discipline. But the core of all of that is faith, because that's what happened in Peter's life. He moved from fear to faith. When he saw Jesus as the risen Lord, as a man in the flesh who he could touch, that he could talk to, who ate with them, who taught them, and did all the stuff that he did before, but much more. Changed Peter. And then you see a guy who stands up in front of crowds of thousands and preaches the gospel. You see a guy who goes to jail multiple times and isn't swayed from his mission. You see a guy that probably only about a month after he was running for his life, in Acts 4, stands in front of the same men who condemned Jesus to die. And those same men say, stop doing what you're doing. And Peter's response is, do I need to be obedient to you or to God? Because I can't help but speak of what I've seen and heard. The fear was eradicated by faith. One of the things that we can take from that is that this isn't a mystical thing that happens, but when we truly place our faith in who Jesus is, and we know that we know that he walked out of the grave, we know that we know that he is at the right hand of God now, we know that when we pray, he hears us. We know that he intercedes. We know that he works on our behalf. We know that he has set us free. We can move from fear to faith. We also see in Peter that he moved from impulsive to being an amazing and solid leader. I love that part of Peter where he just speaks without thinking. One of the first meetings he had with Jesus, this was early on in, in their ministry together. Peter didn't know him very well yet, and actually he had not officially been called to be a disciple. They were getting to know each other, and they were following Jesus and learning from him. And so the guys had been out in the boat. They'd been fishing all night long. And, and after they pull in, they, they sit down for, for Bible study. Isn't that great? For those of you that work nights, like, that's a lot of fun, right? And you work all night long, and you come to church the next day. So that's what happened. But when Jesus finished up the lesson, he turns to Peter and he says, let's get in the boat and push out, and I'm going to tell you where to drop your net. I can see the look on Peter's face because it's the same look some of you guys give me when I'm like, you need to do this. And you're like, yeah, right, preacher. I got you. Peter looks back at him and says, we've been fishing all night. The implication is we're the fishermen. We know what we're doing. And I love the sarcasm. He says, but because you say so, we'll do it. That might not have been how it happened. That's how I picture it. All right, Jesus. Yeah, we're the fishermen, but because you say so, we'll go out there. They did, and they could barely even get the fish in without sinking the boat. But that wasn't the last time that Peter stuck his foot in his mouth. He kind of did it over and over and over again. But I think one of the most significant ones is, is not too far before Jesus went to the cross. And he, he's got the disciples together, and he's asked them, who, who do the people say that I am? And all these crazy answers come out of it. Well, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, like, the smartest thing up to that point that we have in Scripture that he said. He said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. He's like, you're exactly right. Because you didn't get that by yourself. God told you that. And I'm telling you that on the confession that you made, that's the rock I believe Jesus was talking about. He said, you're Peter, but this is a rock. This confession of who I am is a rock. I'm going to build my church on that. And then the conversation changes. And Jesus says, hey, by the way, now this might sound familiar. I'm going to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to rise again. And Peter does exactly the same thing that he would have done. He 
takes Jesus by the arm and pulls him aside and says, Jesus, I'm not going to let that happen. I'm not going to let you die. See, Jesus responds to that. Turn to him and say, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Matthew 16, 23. Man, that is us to a T. We pray, God, I want you to do this. Now, see, here's the thing. Peter thought he had genuine motives. Peter thought he wanted to project, protect Jesus' life, but the reality was he wanted to protect Jesus so Jesus would establish a kingdom so that Peter could have some notoriety. The same way we are. God, if you would just give me this job so I could get a raise, I'd give some more to the church. And I'd get my boat, and I'd get my big screen TV, and I'd get my SUV, and we're going to go on vacation more. God, if you would just bring this woman into my life, then we would serve you together. But mostly, I'm just going to love her, and she's going to make me feel good, and we're going to have kids, and it's not all be about me. We say the right things, but in our heart, we just want God to do something for me. I'll, I'll go to church so that God will do something for me. I'll pray so that God will do something for me. I'll put a little in the offering plate. I'll serve, you know, whatever. Help little, little ladies across the street so that God will do something for me. But Jesus saw through that. So you're a stumbling block. You're holding me back because you're not thinking of the things God wants to do. God has a plan and a purpose. And in that moment, that plan and purpose was for Jesus to suffer and die. A hard reality for us is that not only does God delay or even deny some of those shiny things that we want, but it's actually sometimes his will for us that we would suffer for his will. And I know that's a hard pill to swallow. But you see, God's perspective is different from ours. He's not just focused on the here and now in this world. He's got this perspective from another world, and he sees the whole thing, the whole deal. Paul wrote about light and momentary suffering that we go through. He said that God allows us to go through that to make his glory known. And you might say, well, the thing I'm going through right now doesn't feel light and momentary. Man, this is hard. Man, this hurts. I don't want to go through this anymore. And I know in, in the moment when we're walking through it, it does not seem light and momentary. Not until we back the camera up and we see eternity. And we realize that days, months, years, and even decades in comparison to forever are light and momentary. You see, Peter was transformed once he finally wrapped his mind around what Jesus had done. We see him move into the book of Acts as an amazing leader, stepping up in Acts chapter 2 and explaining what was going on as the Holy Spirit had fallen in Acts chapter 4. We're going to talk about standing up to the Sanhedrin, the same people who had condemned Jesus to die. But then in Acts 15, we see him step up in a crucial moment in time to bring peace into chaos. The backstory to that is that as the gospel had spread throughout the known world at the time, and as people other than Jews were coming to know Christ, it began to cause this divide. You had the ones over here that knew Christ, but they also had been Jews. And so they took all of those amazing sacri not sacrifices, but the, the feasts and the celebrations from the Old Testament, and they just kind of put it on top of Christianity. They, they believed in Jesus, and Jesus was their hope, and they just integrated that stuff from the Old Testament, and that wasn't necessarily a bad thing. But then you have these new believers that didn't do any of that Old Testament stuff. They believed in Jesus. Their faith was secure in him. And all that, that was all that they knew. But then, right? There's always a but then, right? But then, <coughs> these people started coming from this group over to here, and they said, hey, hey, that's not enough. Like, it's good that you believe, but you also need to take all of this stuff and do it also. Believe in Jesus. He is the Lord. He is the Christ. He has set you free from your sin and from your grave. But you also need to observe the Sabbath and keep the Ten Commandments and memorize the Torah, celebrate the feast. And it caused confusion because which is it? Is it Christ alone or is it man? And they did a really smart thing. They got their leaders together. They didn't, they didn't bicker, they didn't have a mammoth church split, pick sides, cast stones. 
vote the pastor out. Right? They didn't do that stuff. And they got their leaders together, and in, in Acts chapter 15, we see that scene. And Peter was one of the first ones to stand up and say, wait a second. We've been there from the beginning, and we heard from the beginning. The gospel is Jesus, and that's it. And by the way, I was one of the first ones that God called to go to the Gentiles. And I saw that when I went to the, God, to the Gentiles and I preached the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that he and he alone could save you. When I told them that, they believed. And we saw that with the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. So God is being consistent. He worked that way with us. He worked that way with them. God is the same. And salvation is rooted in Christ, not the stuff that we do. And the guy that was like, Forever foot in the mouth through what Christ did in him, stood up at the right time in the right moment and said exactly what needed to be said. One of the things that we, not intentionally, but I think that we just, by the nature of the way we do church, have greatly overlooked in our faith is that it, it's not just meant to be like walk an aisle, bow your head, say a prayer, and then just kind of wait out till eternity. Expectation is that we learn and we grow, and that God does a work in our hearts. I promise you that from running for his life, from saying the wrong thing, from cutting off Malchus' ear, to the guy who stood up in that room and said the right thing at the right time, a whole lot had happened. A whole lot of life experience, a whole lot of time on his knees, a whole lot of time searching and studying God's word, and that was what transformed him and made him what he needed to be right here. And by the way, a part of that also includes all that nasty stuff that we don't want to go through. It was something that I had debated on sharing with you today, but I think it I think it'll be good for us. Grab it real quick. If I'm remembering correctly, if you want to go with me, this is going to be in First Peter, towards the end of your Bible, right after James. First Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Listen to this wonderful change. Now, of course, we know, we believe, and Peter actually wrote this, um, that, that, that what we hold in our hands wasn't just the thoughts and the ideas of those that wrote them. The Holy Spirit literally, Peter wrote, carried them along as they gave us God's word. And so, so this is coming from the Holy Spirit. But he, we also have evidence that he used the people, like he used their personality, he used their knowledge, and all of that. And so I, I think this is, this is definitely preserved and perf made perfect by the Holy Spirit working through Peter as he wrote. But this is also coming from, from, from the life experience of a guy who used to, uh, the guy who said this, the guy that said, I'm not going to let you die because that ruins my plans. I, I, I will die first. Because it's all about what I want to happen. Later in his life, he wrote this, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. He says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal, even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear the name. What an amazing testimony of transformation of what God had done in his heart because the, the resurrection became real because the hope that Peter had had become real. Later on, he could write, and we believe that when he wrote that, he wrote to people who were suffering because of their faith. Very specific. They weren't just having a bad day. They didn't just lose their job. It wasn't family issues. And people were suffering and dying because they believed in Jesus. And he said, hold on. Be surprised by this thing that you're going through, a fiery trial, he calls it. But hold on for God's glory and give praise to God that you would bear his name as you walk through this to let him shine in you. Last, we see that Peter goes from failure to unstoppable. The 
gospel, I believe, is all about taking people from failure to triumph. Not ours, but God's. At a crucial moment, in Peter's mind at least, he must have felt like he, he let Jesus down. In, in, in the greatest way that you can do it. In that scene between the upper room and going to the Mount of Olives, Jesus again said, now that we're here, I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. Peter said, that, that can't happen. I, I would die first. And Jesus said, actually, I'm going to tell you the truth. You're going to deny me three times before morning. Peter, of course, not. That's not going to happen. And when the heat was turned on, Peter ran. And then the first stop where they took Jesus was they took Jesus to the father-in-law of the high priest. And in his home, Jesus was beaten and questioned. And just outside of the courtyard, Peter and John were there. John knew the family, and so John was able to sneak them in. And so person after person in that scenario recognized Peter. You've got a little girl that says, hey, aren't you one of his disciples? No, no, that's not me. You're crazy. I'm not that guy. Someone else, hey, wait, you sound like a Galilean, and all of them were from the, the place called Galilee. Like the difference between our accent and all those people from the north, right? I mean, like You can tell who's from where, right, by the way they talk. And it was the same for them. They could tell that Peter was not from their area. Like, he's one of those northern people, right? Uh, love you all. He was like, no, that's not me. <coughs> Another guy, wait, I saw you. That is not me. He, he actually calls down curses. It's not me. It's another guy. I'm not who you think I am. Horrible, horrible, horrible in his mind. Failure. I believe that's why even after he saw the resurrected Jesus, we see Peter get in a boat and go back to fishing. Because that's what we do when we feel like we've blown it so bad we can't come back. And the enemy loves to capitalize on that. He loves to use that to just destroy relationships and to keep us from reuniting, especially to keep us from reuniting to God. And I can promise you that's what was going on in Peter's life because Jesus actually said, Satan's asked to sift you. And that was probably going on in that moment. You're a failure. You let him down. You are no good. You said you would die for him. He died alone. And now he's resurrected. He gets in a boat and goes out and goes back to fishing. But as Jesus is so prone to do, I mean, he tells the story of the prodigal son where when the son realizes he could come home and he does, the father welcomes him and wraps his arm around him. He tells the story of the sheep and he says, doesn't the shepherd leave the 99 and go after the one that is lost? And that was what Jesus did that day. He stood on the bank and he said, bring the boat in. And he fixed them breakfast. And then he takes Peter, specifically Peter, and he takes him for a walk. And on that walk, he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And Peter must have felt a little better. And Jesus turns to him again. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you. I mean, come on, you know everything. You know my heart. You know I love you. Probably feel a little bit better now. Maybe confused. And then he looks at him again. Peter. Peter. Do you love me? Why would you ask me that? Because Peter was hurt that Jesus had asked him a third time. What Peter didn't realize is that Jesus was giving him the opportunity to affirm his love for every time he had denied him. And let me tell you, he gives us a chance to come back for every time that we have failed. He gives us a chance to be made whole for every time we drop the ball. He gives us a time to restart for every time that we have gone astray. Peter, do you love me? Why would you ask that? You know I love you. I told you I love you. Be my sheep. See, in a way what Jesus did there was twofold. Like He, he brought Peter home. He told him he could come home. Then he also reminded him of his calling. 
one of the great traps for us is, is that we see leadership as being in charge and telling people what to do, but that was never Jesus' model. Jesus' model of leadership is that we would sacrifice for those that we lead, that we would feed them, that we would protect them, that we would serve them. Jesus modeled that by washing their feet. I love the fact that he even washed the feet of Judas. They cared for them. They watched over them. They protected them. And in essence, what he was saying to Peter was, you do that for my sheep. We see that going into Acts, and we, we hear that in Peter's letters. That he was no longer a man that was in it for the notoriety, that was in it for the spotlight, that was in it for being up front. He, he was in it because God had called him, and because God had given him a message and a mission to feed the sheep. And what we see now is that, that Peter carries that all the way to his grave, just like Jesus told him would. And so he wasn't afraid to stand in front of the crowd. He wasn't afraid to stand in front of the church. He wasn't afraid to go to the Gentiles when God called him. He wasn't afraid to go to prison. And he wasn't afraid to walk out of prison and go back to work. And I believe it was Eusebius who then recorded that when it came all down to the end in his latter years, that on a horrible, horrible day, Peter watched his wife be crucified, and then the next day he was. For his faith. And you hear that, and you might say, holy cow, well then how can you say he was unstoppable? Because he died. Because when Paul would later write about the resurrection, he says a couple of things. One is in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, if, if there is no resurrection, then our hope is in vain. Like, we might as well not do any of this stuff if Jesus didn't walk out of the grave. But not only is all of this useless, like, we are to be pitied above everybody else in the world because we got huckstered. Like, we believed a liar. We fell for it. And it's all meaningless. We were wasting our time coming together and giving money and praying and all of that if Jesus didn't walk out of the grave. But then he says, but if he did walk out of the grave, then the old me is dead and gone. If he did walk out of the grave, then my sin is atoned for, meaning completely paid for, completely wiped away. If he did walk out of the grave, then I have a hope. When Jesus gathered disciples together in John 14 and said, I'm going to go and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come back and get you and take you there with me. Specifically, he said, Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the power of the law. Thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. When you have your mind settled on that, that this life is not the end, then you don't fear death. And there's nothing in this world, excuse me, that can stop us. More importantly, there's nothing in this world that can stop what God is doing. In 1950, so approximately 1,940 something years after all this happened, five missionaries went to South America with their family. And I remember two of their names. You, you may recognize them Jim Elliott and Nate Sam. <coughs> three friends and, and all of their family relocated down there and their desire was to take the gospel to a place where no one else had taken it and so because they were pilots they used that to their advantage and so they would fly to these tribes who lived around the Amazon and, and they would come in and they would drop supplies and the plan was that we'll drop the supplies and we'll give them food and we'll give them things that they need to build trust and to build relationships. And they knew that these tribes were hostile and they knew that they were dangerous, but they were willing to accept the risk because death is defeated. Like there is nothing that we need to be afraid of. We can go in, we can reach out to them. And you know, in America, we've accepted this lie that we can be safe and we can be comfortable, we can be well fed. We've missed the fact that that is not the gospel. The gospel is suffering, the gospel is risk, the gospel is doing whatever it takes to take that message to someone else. And they accepted that and they knew the risk when they landed on the beach that day. But their hope was that they were beginning a relationship with these people. When they landed and got out of the plane, the men that they didn't see that were in the wood line just beyond their vision rushed them, 
speared them to death and they left their bodies there. Here's what I mean by unstoppable. If it's just what we can do in the flesh, if there is no resurrection, if there is no God, if there is no Christ, then it all stops there. It stops with five dead men on a beach. And then the craziest thing happened as a result of those men's death. One is their families stayed. And their families were crucial in reaching the people who had killed those men. But not only that, when the story of what happened to them began to infiltrate our college campuses around America, hundreds of students answered the call to missions and they went all over the world for the cause of Christ. You see, when it's not about us, when it's not about me and it's not about you and it's not about what we do physically, when we understand that we are tapping into an all-powerful and almighty God for whom the grave is not a barrier, it's not even an afterthought, then the work moves forward. It doesn't shrink back from death. It doesn't shrink back from fear. It doesn't shrink back from the past. And so, Hopefully something you've seen, which I think is one of the greatest evidences for the resurrection, is that a man named Peter, who had followed Jesus from the very beginning, and had heard him talk, and had seen him minister, and saw his dead body, and then saw the empty grave, was radically and utterly transformed by that fact. <coughs> same restart that was available to Peter is available to you right here and right now. Whether you're that skeptic or you're the one that, like, I, I buy this all. I, like, I get it. I believe it. No matter where you may be in the middle, today can be the day of your restart that because of what Christ has done, that we understand that there is a God, and that God loves us, and that God spanned the universe and our sin in order to bring us home. And so Jesus then is the only way to him because he was the only one that could pay the price for our sin, and he was the only one who could come out by his own power. Jesus said, I lay my life down only to take it up again by my own authority. minutes the band is going to lead us in a song that talks about what it's going to be like when we see him face to face if I remember right I'm sorry I might be off but here's what I want to ask you to do this morning I know it's been kind of a long service busy day a lot ahead of you but I want to ask you to just kind of still be still and quiet just take a moment to connect with God, no matter who you are. Has this event transformed you as it did Peter and all the others? Have you had a restart? Have you been made whole and, and, and restored to God? Have you allowed him to breathe new life into you? Have you allowed him to send you back out in the community to take that message and that pray for you in just a minute and I'm going to give you some options because I love options I don't like it when there's only one thing to do so I, I give you a lot of options and so here they are one is that you can stay right where you are and do business with God there but if sometimes you, you just need somebody else you need someone to pray with you you need someone to be a sounding board maybe if this is all kind of new to you maybe you have some questions this morning and so leaders from our church are going to step out from their seats as soon as I start praying, guys, I want you to step off your knees. Sunday school teachers, deacons, leaders, they're just going to go to the outside and the back of the room. And if you want to grab somebody by the hand and talk and pray with them, you're welcome to find one of them or to come to me. I'll be here as well. Uh, for some of you believers that, that you're, you're praying out, like this has been a really good day, you've been celebrating, and you, you've really drawn close to God, uh, I would love it if you would let the Holy Spirit just move you towards somebody and pray for them this morning. Uh, just, I promise you, if you just look around this room, you're going to see someone um, that God's going to want you to pray for. And just go right ahead and do that. Um, or go to the back wall if you would. And there's tons of prayer requests on that prayer wall back there. And we want to make sure that we cover with prayer. Be 
beyond anything else, Lord, I want you to take this moment, this opportunity to do business with God. In our hurried life, we don't sit still and quiet nearly often enough to hear the Holy Spirit moving in our hearts. We just drown Him out with entertainment. We're drowning Him out with activity. We're drowning Him out with all kinds of stuff. And so if you would, just take this moment to do that. It's okay if you don't sing a note. God, I thank you for this moment and for everything that has led up to it. Everything that led up to this moment 2,000 plus years ago as our dear Lamb of God took our place on an old rugged cross. God, I pray that that moment would be real to all of us in this room. For anyone that, that, that might have trouble believing, God, I pray that you would give them faith. Saving, transforming, Lord, I also know that anytime there are this many people gathered together in one place, that there are hurts that the rest of us don't know about and maybe can't even imagine. And so I pray, God, for healing in those dark and hurting places. God, I pray that right now in this moment that someone would feel you just wrapping your arms around them, touching them, healing their body, healing their heart, healing their broken spirit. That you would work wonderfully in their life. God, I pray that, that there are many, but at least that there would be one this morning who has sat through all of this and they're saying it makes sense now, and I get it now, and I believe now, and they're thinking, what do I do next? God, I pray, I praise you for that. I also pray that for that person, you would help them to just draw close to you. And maybe just offer up a prayer or something like this that just says, I believe that you are my God. I believe that you have loved me and sent your son. I believe that he lived a perfect life. I believe that he died in my place. And I believe that he lives in me. Just something that simple, God. And I pray as your word says that you give them peace and assurance that at this moment, right now, they are sealed with you and with your Holy Spirit. God, I pray for the one who's looking for a church to connect to. I pray for the one who's looking for a place to minister. I pray for the one who maybe has a big decision. They're just not sure what to do. That you would help them to find someone to pray with this morning. For others, God, I pray that you would lead them through your Holy Spirit with whom to pray for. And I pray that this moment would be a significant moment in our lives as individuals and as a church where we seek your face for a restart.